Good evening, everyone. Uh, today we have Ms. Anne Somia with us. She's the director of HR of Deco Group. We welcome you, Anne, on board. We are having a very healthy discussion on a new topic today. It's on can CHROs be the next level CEOs? Well, just to give a brief backdrop, for decades, the corporate HR department was seen as a back office function, a cost center focused, you know, on mundane administrative tasks such as managing compensation and benefit plans. But very recently, when we hear uh, Lena Nair, she was given a jump from being a CHRO to a CEO. You know, such messages started to float. Thrilled to see CHRO make a pathway as a CEO. Happy to see CHROs move into a CEO position. This is a great news for HR professionals. You just made the CEO position real for all of us at HR. You know, way to go. Now, these were some of the exultant messages for Lena Nair as people rushed to facilitate the former Unilever Chief Human Resource Officer on social media. Soon she was named Global CEO of French fashion group Chanel last month, last to last month, we could say. Now, given this long held prejudice, my question is directly to you, Anne. Is Nair's stellar rise on one off? Or, you know, does it indicate organizations are becoming increasingly open to the idea of CEOs uh, from the HR domain? And are HR chiefs ready for the transition to the top job stage is all yours? Thank you, Sugant. Very, very interesting question indeed. And one that has garnered a lot of interest and piqued national interest for, um, I might say, with her uh, announcement. I think there were two groups, two uh, troops um, uh, jubilating over this announcement. One was the whole Indian community and the second was the HR community across the world. So um, if I hear your question right, you know, there are two things I'd like to break it down, you know, please enough, uh, yeah. join me as we break it down into two sure. groups, two things. So one is, uh, is uh, the announcement of uh, Lena Nair uh, a singular event? Uh, which we which has cost a lot of uh, attention. Exactly, you know, is it just a one-time thing? Is it something that you know is more of a far that we won't see more uh, CHROs becoming CEOs, or do you think it's a new trend now that's going to be carried for times to come? Absolutely. So to answer that question first about what is it a ripple or actually is this a wave? Um, right. So uh, this, uh, you know, I was thinking, as I was thinking about this topic, I kind of went back and read about it. So first time that I saw something being uh, discussed about CHROs as potential CEOs as a serious topic uh, came up when uh, around 2014 in an article published by the uh, Harvard Business Review. It right. was a study by Dave Ulrich, um, a Michigan University professor and Ellie Filler, who is uh, part of a CC executive search firm. So they were studying actually is is among the top C-suite executives who are CFOs, CMOs, CIOs, CHROs or COOs um, for that matter, um, Mm -hmm. whose um, skill sets were closest match to the CEO. So they compared about 14 traits which they categorized into leadership style, thinking style, um, you know, emotional intelligence style, so on and so forth. And they published a study and surprisingly, and they call that report a provocative prescription at that time, uh, because nobody was expecting that, that CHROs actually uh, came closest match with what they then thought was um, the unique skill sets that were required of CEOs. So that was the first time I saw this coming in. And um, ever since that, or around that time, we hear so many other names that have also come through. Huh? So I've heard of uh, Lisa Weber, who's the CEO of MetLife, Mary Barra, uh, General Motors. We have Nigel Travis, who's Duncan uh, Brands, who's, we would have all heard of Burger King and Papa Jones. So right. That's- Right, right. And uh, Malkahe, who's heading Xerox, who all were CHROs, 
who then became CEOs. And closer to home uh, at ADECO India, we are very proud to say that our current CEO, uh, Vidya Sagar Ganamani, has also been a CHRO before in his past um, stint as uh, oh, CHRO really? for Philips before he moved on to take on this role as uh, CEO for ADECO. So we have many stories, many studies okay. uh, right. that have uh, pre that have been precedents to uh, Lena Nair's announcement. So it's quite reason to believe that it's not a ripple, and in fact, more of a wave that we can expect more of. Do you think that you know, in times of pandemic and in the post-pandemic world, when uh, you know a CHRO or an HR person had to adorn different hats, do you think this was a time that you know the credibility of a CHRO was more into a limelight that you know if they can manage an adverse situation like a pandemic and still keep the company is going, then they are definitely you know. Uh, eligible to be you know leading a company or be a, be a ceo so do you think this this mind change has been in high post pandemic i i think i would absolutely agree you know if you think about it we've heard of this term vuca world right right um, a world that is marked by volatility uncertainty complexity ambiguity mm -hmm. so um in in this in, the post the pandemic has actually put us into a situation which can very broadly be said, yes, we are living the VUCA times. And um, uh, during this time, I think, again, studies uh, prescribe that what is required, what are the traits required of a CEO, right, traditionally and now, has have those changed? So if you just evaluate and think, what are those traits that you would think a CEO is, is uh, required to display? Uh, you know, top of the mind is uh, the best CEOs I have worked with, at least, you know, I can think of says ability to set strategic vision, uh, build and develop teams that have skills to execute on this vision, uh, orchestrate both short term as well as long-term goals and performance to these towards these goals, uh, understand what are the performance levers uh, of each businesses and manage them with rigor. Um, and biggest one is rally the organization towards this common goal, right? Through the ups and downs of uh, performance cycles. So this, this has been always what a CEO's role actually is. Right? Exactly. And now if you look at uh, a, a, a CHRO's role and does mm -hmm. these correlate more, uh, I think a couple of these or many of these uh, are, uh, as a CHRO, you have access mm -hmm. to practice. Perhaps, especially with when it comes to rallying teams and identifying, putting people at the right place and rallying them towards building a trust factor in the organization and getting them to, to desired goals. I think the CHRO has an access to practice this or has an access to or a platform to practice these skills which a CEO requires. And during the VUCA world, it has again been established that empathetic leadership is one of the most important traits Very that true. every organization is looking for in a CEO. So these are, like I said, these are again um, uh, values or skill mm -hmm. sets that a CHRO by default has a predisposition or an access to. But it necessarily does not guarantee that a CHRO will have all of this. So even in the right. Dave Aldrich uh, study, uh, the 14 skill sets that they studied were um, concentrated on the 10 top, the top 10% uh, CHROs were considered most successful. So um, what reason to believe is the top 10% had these values, uh, empathy and leadership and uh, rallying the organization and building right. performance. But it does not necessarily guarantee the larger population may or may not have it. So, um, you know, do I think that a CHRO, by being a CHRO, uh, gives an additional advantage or an edge? 
uh, see access is different from mm-hmm. actually possessing it. We may all, including you know, we may all have gotten access to some of the best schools and education during our parents might have very hopefully put us through some of the best schools and best colleges. Right. I know what became of it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so access does not guarantee, but uh, what you brought out of those platforms, what you brought out of that access, that may give you an additional advantage. So a CHRO who has access to this is more predispositioned to gain these skill sets. And hence, if he or she has it, then definitely becomes a, a desirable candidate. And uh, the same, same applies for all the other uh, Amazing. And you explained it so well. You know, I'd also like to add while you say empathy is such a behavioral trait, which is required in a leader, I would say it is required from an employee's end as well. You know, in times wherein certain organizations have gone up to the level of just cutting salaries, but, you know, not asking their employees to leave. Of course, you know, there is a level of empathy which is expected from employees towards the employer as well. You know, and that is one of the behavioral traits that we see, uh, you know, marching up towards the CEO level because now we're opening an avenue for, uh, you know, CHRO becoming a CEO. You know, I would also like to, you know, ask that, you know, along with CHRO's acumen as a strategic partner in business and a greater 360 degree view of the entire business, what other traits can give the person an edge in the race of the CEO role? Wow. Okay, that's quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, great question, Sugand. Again, I would start with saying, um, if you want to be a general, you've got to start working at the infantry, okay. right? So, so if you're lo- looking to lead uh, a business, if you start, if you're looking to lead um, uh, an organization, you need to know the nuts and bolts. Right. You need to know the grassroots level. What actually is our product? Um, Mm -hmm. What is uh, who are our customers? What who are our competition? What's our market like? And be hands on. So if you look at uh, even the, the names that we spoke of in the in, earlier today, uh, be it Lena Nair or uh, Mary Barra or Anne McCulley, all of these folks, if you look at it, you know, they, they have done stints in various uh, roles outside of HR as well. The classic example is Anne, uh, head of Xerox. Um, she actually rose to the position of CHRO through sales. Uh, and then CHRO and and eventually the CEO. CEO. So I heard it. Yeah, I also heard an interview of uh, Lena Nair um, uh, where she was talking about, um, you know, being there at the plant. And it was pretty unusual at those times when she had started off her career uh, as a management trainee for a woman and uh, to be placed at a, a plant at a, or a factory. So uh, she, has been, she says that she's been in the remote outskirts of the country uh, selling tea bags to actually understanding what does a customer want have been to uh, remote areas where there are um, uh, outskirts or outlets where they actually sell directly to customers. So she's been part of the entire cycle. So um, my advice or my take would be that, um, you know, great, you do earn a, a great understanding of behavior of people, of relationships and how the organization works and how you can um, rally teams and people to deliver to your strategy, but you also need to know how the mechanics of the organization works. Um, Our CEO, for example, one of the first meetings we had uh, with him, I still remember, he brought up the term gamba. It's from the Japanese lean methodology uh, terminology. It says, be where the action happens. So, um, he persuaded us to actually go visit one of the factories where we were um, involved in a project, see how it works. Even the, the you know, the location-wise mapping of where does a person move from one place to the other? How does the work flow? And then start thinking of how do you make this better? How do you um, uh, uh, re-engineer this process? How, what sort of 
people do you need there? What sort of mindsets do you need? What is the strategy that you need for that uh, particular project? So I think the, the, the biggest um, skill sets that a CHRO might need to be open to get uh, uh, to get to other roles is uh, to muddy their hands a bit more, to understand sales, to understand finance, to understand customers and all the stakeholders, a 360 view of the stakeholders. Yeah, basically you're saying from the grassroots level you know a person who's leading an organization should have gone through those pain points that you know he can actually uh, give uh, solutions to basically yes, absolutely. Uh, lena i i mean along with lena there are many such examples that you gave and are the clear-cut proof that you know if you've got to be on the leadership level and a successful leader of course because there are many leaders onto different domains you need to go through the similar pain points of which you are preparing solutions for because until and unless you're not in their shoes you cannot understand the depth of the problem absolutely and i clearly agree with your view you yeah. know also in the I current sorry, 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 sorry. No, I no, want please. to add one point here you know and this this really resonates this this uh, really resonates uh, to me because uh, i meet a lot of youngsters who are uh, getting into their careers i meet a lot of i speak to a lot of college colleges for their graduate hires so one of the things i consistently hear sometimes is hey, um, the new job that I'm getting into or what I'm doing is different from what I studied um, or this is not what I thought HR was. When they, they aspire to get into HR, they say, okay, this mm -hmm. is not what I thought HR should be. Or, exactly. Should I get into this because marketing or, or sales is not something that I uh, intended to because I've very specifically taken uh, human resources. So, um, uh, you know, those to me are warning bells or I, I really do wish I can communicate to them that my friend at this time, uh, the best thing that could happen to you when you're looking at building your career is to move around as much. To, to go around the whole circle to experience and then take your call on where you want to. So I can also quote my own example. I think I've had a checkered career. Um, and uh, I often say I, I'm an accidental HR person because I started my career in business, uh, in okay. uh, frontline, uh, doing um, client servicing, then customer servicing, moved into taking up other things like Six Sigma, process control, before actually quite accidentally um, chancing upon HR through um, learning and development. But I now feel that's also one of the biggest advantages um, uh, that I have, uh, because when my business leaders talk to me, I can relate much better because we've done because, you know, I feel like I've been there. I've done that. I get you. And it's much more easier to be a trusted partner and not a back office function anymore if you have <laughs> done this um, circular rounds with your career. So that would be my submission to all um, youngsters who are starting off in their careers as fresh grads or at the early parts of their career. Take chances. No, one must. You know, as we now say, uh, the accidental HR that you <laughs> called yourself. Uh, you know, in current environment, of what do you think are the attributes that an HR or CHR have to develop to transcend their past roles and assure that the future success of companies they oversee as a CEO? I wouldn't say that you have to leave certain behavioral traits, but then you actually need to gain an expertise into certain others. So how do you think one needs to manage that? So I think partly we answered that in our previous um, uh, um, uh, question, uh, Sugand, we are saying that, you know, um, uh, the uh, HR professional by default has had access to a lot of things which a CEO needs, which is um, getting teams together or identifying what is required, what sort of talent is required, what skill sets are required, and rallying towards a common goal or purpose. What probably we need to now um, uh, start um, investing ourselves and developing ourselves is into the other aspects of running a business, which is what I told about 
you know, being at the infantry or, or Gemba where the action happens to really understand the nuts and bolts of your business and um, uh, how the entire p uh, cycle flows. So those would be the additional skills that I would say are very important to making a CHRO successfully transition into a CEO role. Also, do you think that now it is a time while we are opening this avenue uh, for a CHRO to be a CEO, there is there should also be times wherein people from other segments, being a CTO or a CMO or a COO, should also be given that certain amount of leverage and an option to actually go on to the leadership positions, but uh, not just a uh, with the way that, you know, I want to be a leader, they should also get certain amount of trainings. So there should be sessions within an organization from a person to any level who aspires to be a leader. Do you think there should be leadership transformation webinars or discussions within an organization? And do they require the, uh, you know, trainings uh, to go onto the ladder of being a leader? I absolutely agree, uh, Sugan. And I think it's 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 part of every organization to invest in and develop their leaders for their own benefit. I think succession planning is taken very seriously. Uh, at least in our organization, we see that um, we have a commitment to even have, uh, we have a metric actually that we, we put in to say, hey, our, of all the global leadership positions, 70% of that has to be filled with internal talent, which is developed and grown. And how do we do that? Or how does organizations do that is through continuous investment. There could be, um, you know, uh, soft skill or, or potential development uh, programs where you're looking at um, the person's uh, softer aspects of the person's skill sets, which is empathy or, or uh, communication or uh, developing uh, people management or conflict management, so on and so forth. And also the uh, other technical skills that are required, whether it is financial equipment, whether it is uh, understanding the market that you're in, understanding the product that you're in. So yes, I think all organizations do, and if they don't, must um, start very seriously looking into developing uh, talent internally. And like you very rightly said, it's not just the CHRO in discussion right now. Yes, there is a spotlight because of the recent events and the right. way but it necessarily does does not have to be restricted there. I think all the C-suit um, uh, colleagues who are at uh, a, a seniority level have a fair um, opportunity to progress and aspire to these. So we need to really look at what are those gaps, look at the um, uh, skill gaps and identify where do you invest? and how do you grow them? And each person's developmental journey may have a different timeline altogether. There might be someone who is at a path to a CEO in maybe zero to two years, uh, but there may be another person in the same team of uh, C-suite executives that who may have three to five years as their um, uh, succession path. So there is no, no reason for us to feel that, you know, there has to be only one successor and it has to come from either uh, a function or not. Now, when we are talking about elevating people from different verticals onto being a leader and training them, another issue that comes is gender parity, you know, uh, I've seen in organizations and according to surveys also, even when it comes to training people, you know, to be onto the CEO level or on a leadership level, there is more emphasis on men, you know, less em emphasis on women. Yes, we do have examples to share, but we only have examples to share because we only have a handful of people as of now that we can share. You know, there should be a time wherein we could say that, you know, we cannot share uh, the numbers because it's equivalent. But this is not that time right now. So how do you think an organization should manage gender parity when preparing their employees to go on to a leadership level? Uh, see, this is a very passionate subject you've passed on. So uh, let, me, <laughs> let me try to see how I can contain it within the timelines that we have for this uh, discussion. Sure. Um, see, I think gender parity has has been a uh, um, a, a, a a force to reckon with and um, 
I think organizations across the world have woken up to the reality. There's been many uh, surveys, many articles, many sub, uh, you know analytics that have proven um, that have statistics varying from um, uh, you know twenty percent to up, all the way up to sixty seven percent improvement of financial matrices um, where organizations have higher gender parity or women leaders in their uh, on their board. So uh, I don't think there's any more debate uh, or any more, um, uh, you know, any, any, anyone more left who needs to be evangelized. I think most of us have already bought into this, that uh, gender parity is, is of um, supreme importance and great benefits for organizations. But I think what organizations struggle with is the how to do it. We've all accepted it. But how do you convert this gender parity and this question of gender e equality uh, to practice? How do you actually move the metric? We are not so sure yet, right? Mm -hmm. If you want to change something and you do something constantly the same way again and again, and you expect different results, you're not likely to get that. In fact, I, Einstein coined saying, doing something the same way and expecting different results is called insanity. So um, I think what we need to um, be aware is if we are looking at bringing a, a workforce that is more gender equal, we also need to have policies and we also need to have work environments that, um, that uh, are conducive to a more gender equivalent um, uh, workplace. So we do know that the, uh, the needs that uh, a woman has when she comes to the workplaces could be very different. There's an interesting picture that comes to my mind uh, that when somebody was trying to explain gender parity, it's about a track, a race track, right? And mm -hmm. the race track where there is women and men, if you see the track before the men, it's clear, it's a, a, a a, a, a flat Mood flow. Yes. Whereas if you see the track before the woman, you have a washing machine, you have a dishwasher, you have the baby clothes, you have the family, etc. So it's a perfect picture. Not, yes. So it's not just a, a race, it's actually a hurdle jump. Right. Yeah. So I think there needs to be practices that help women um, balance uh, what what their needs are. I think we have built workplaces that can be um, very, very uh, conducive for both genders and be um, conducive for what a woman needs and how she can contribute as well. I think more and more workplaces are waking up to that. We are very happy to boast of a workplace that has 51% female population at Edeco India right now. Oh, amazing. Um, and, uh, and, and we do that through a series of um, uh, actions that we've created, right? It's not something that we decided and got overnight, but it has to have a lot of activities that go into it to say that the gender parity is not just at the lower rungs, but we also make it possible for women to continue and working and continue contributing through their life events. So through, through marriage, through motherhood, through right. um, parenting, all of this, how do we support and make sure that we give uh, an opportunity for women to contribute? So uh, I also read very recently in, some, uh, in, a, in a forward that I got about a lady who was um, uh, heading Google's AI um, uh, analytics. So mm -hmm. she was given that job after she came after, after she was a returning mom after an eight year gap. So she says that, you know, I was just blessed to even have gotten that job because I was very worried, let alone AI. Um, I was very worried even if I'll get any job because I was a returning mom after eight At years. Least sabbatical, yeah. Yeah. So and finally, she says the CHRO of Google, um, you know, comments saying, if you want to get the job done, I would hire a mother. Oh, amazing. I mean, uh, as much as I had uh, picked and painted a very passionate subject, but it was very important to lay emphasis onto the fact that, you know, while going towards a growth trajectory, we need to keep in mind that, you know, gender disparity is something that needs to vanish now. 
you know, and both uh, male and female need to be given that equal amount of importance as well as training. And, you know, the deserving candidate needs to go on to a leadership position while I'm being flooded with number of questions. And I'm just going to pick up one. And, you know, that is of Rachna Bhutoria. Now, she says that we're in the middle of a job crisis. How do you think technology can help in job creation in terms of creating access to all uh, or leading to sectorial growth? Okay, very interesting question, Ratna. So um, let me, again, you know, I like breaking things down and then answering them. Sure, uh, sure. I think I have a very limited um, <laughs> brain space and attention span. So I like breaking things down and getting to it. She, she's so, asked that one, how do you think technology can help in job creation? That's point yeah. number one. And in terms of creating access to all or leading to sectorial growth. Yeah. So I think I'd, the first thing I would like to address is uh, the the part where Rachana mentions that there is a job crisis, right? Exactly. So, um, so two things. I think, yes, um, certain sectors, yes, there are crises, but there's also um, a huge boom in certain other sectors. Um, so if you look at the job market right now, I would say it's quite unequal. unequivocal. So it's not that the job crisis exists throughout. In certain sectors, um, we, you know, at, at Adeco, we are, uh, we are, our main, one of our main businesses is, um, mat, you know, finding candidates and placing them to the right opportunities. So we work with placing 100,000 people every year. And what we see, and we have a visibility to the 360 ecosystem of work and various industries. What we see is, is that what we see is that there are certain industries where it is now, rather than being a, a, a employer-driven job market, it's a candidate-driven job market. Right. So we we see that every candidate has uh, more than two or three offers. And he or she is at a liberty to pick where they want to join. And often they join organizations um, wh which appeal highest to them, which provides stability, which provides uh, uh, growth. All of all of that comes as a whole package. So um, to answer the first part of breaking down the first part of saying, hey, is there a job crisis? The answer is yes and no. There could be segments that have been very, very devastatingly hit uh, because of the, uh, the COVID and the changes in the market due to that. Okay. But there are sectors that have also uh, exponentially grown, which are booming. So I think this is where technology can bring um, clarity, transparency, and make it visible to candidates. Hey, where, where should I move to? Right? We change, we need to change with times. So if you're have been in the hospitality industry, which has gotten uh, hit very badly. Uh, do I keep looking and waiting for jobs in the same sector or do I transform myself, pick up skills that I require and go where uh, the sun shines? Um, I think that's what technology can help you, help us do, Rachna. So uh, look, looking at um, job portals, looking at ca career sites, looking at uh, recent research and publications on, on what skill sets are required, which industry is booming, and then help candidates to to um, gravitate towards those industries. I think that's what technology can help us do. I hope, Rachna, your question has been answered uh, within the time frame that we have for further discussion as well. While if you have other questions or counter questions from her, we'll be placing the video across our uh, BW platforms. You can have a word with her straight away there and she'll be very happy to answer. Now I'll be going uh, towards the very last question. Uh, uh, and that is with regards to we've seen uh, this, you know, sudden drift where internally people are being given this avenue to explore a leadership on a CEO level. Do you think it is a transitory mode or a welcoming change to an extent that it doesn't become a trend just to set examples? It should become more of a culture. Completely agree with you and your statement. Absolutely. I don't think it is a blip in the uh, metaverse. It has to be uh, a, a, a more repetitive and uh, it has to be the way to go. Because um, one, um, 
developing and um, investing talent within the organization, it gives the organization the unique advantage of having someone who actually knows the business, knows your stakeholders, and knows that fine thread, which is called the culture of, uh, uh, of the organization, uh, to know which buttons to push and make it work. Right. So right. you could have someone who comes in with the best strategy, but we all mm -hmm. have heard Peter Ducker when he says culture eats strategy for breakfast. Exactly. So having someone who actually knows the nuances of that or that invisible thread that holds an organization together and who can work that to their benefit is always the uh, unique advantage that an internal candidate brings. Second thing it does is it in immediately in the eyes of your current employees, it immediately elevates your organization's desirability uh, much, much exponentially higher. If you if they see that you are not just someone who, who uh, has great boardroom hangings about employees being at the heart of what we do and we invest in our employees, but actually someone who walks the talk when you show them that, hey, here's an organization that, that is ready to invest, take risks and develop internal talent, it becomes a role model or a, a, a case in instance for others to look up to and want to be with that organization. And uh, finally, it also kind of puts um, you up and your organization up as an employer of choice when you're out in the market uh, competing for talent war that exists now. Fair enough. And uh, while I see that, you know, there is such a steady change within uh, people from your level as well, wherein they're thinking that this change shouldn't be transitory. It should be more on the growth of uh, trajectory and towards uh, last piece of advice that I would want you to give it to your audiences as to what are the top five uh, key takeaways from the discussions that we've just had. Sure, I don't know if I will have five, but definitely let me give it a shot. <laughs> sure, no, we can have more as well, but then just, uh, you know, to jot down what are the certain aspects that we need to keep in mind while keeping this thought on the road that any leader, you know, any person from any segment, from any level can actually aim to be a leader. You know, there shouldn't be the hurdles and hassles that you've just, uh, you know, imagined for a woman. That shouldn't be the case. Absolutely. Absolutely. So first thing I would say um, as a takeaway that we uh, that we spoke of is that that line which just sticks to me that if you want to be a general go start working at the infantry. So I think that's that's a big takeaway for anyone who's aspiring to, to grow within an organization, take leadership roles, especially um, roles that are uh, C-suite, right? So don't, don't um, be um, very restrictive to say that, hey, this is the field that I, I want to be an expert in. This is where I worked last seven years. So I want to continue doing this. So don't be restrictive. I think you need to understand and be open to taking that, um, uh, taking those changes, taking those risks and learning all aspects about the business and your organization and its stakeholders. So that's the first and foremost. The second thing I would say is, you know, in there's an interesting research that also when I was reading about CHROs turned CEOs, um, apparently it said that 57% of people um, when asked whether they aspire to be CH CEOs uh, who were in the HR domain or in a different domain, they actually said no. Okay. 57 people said they would rather stay in their current domain and continue growing there because that's their comfort zone, right? So, so you mean to say people don't want to come out of the comfort zone to be on to a leadership level? Absolutely. Okay. So okay. The, so uh, we, we all have heard about it. I hope you've heard about it. Mm -hmm. um, you have your comfort zone and outside it is your growth zone. So unless you take the leap, 
and you are ready to move into something that is uncomfortable, then you then you are not going to be able to grow. So uh, make sure that uh, your if your target is growth, you are also able to step into those uh, um, uncomfortable situations and stretch yourself more. So you step know, out has, of that. One has to, you know, that is that is uh, you know a statement a steady statement for anyone who wishes to grow it is not just for someone who wants to be on a leadership level i would say even if you want to grow internally from your positions or from different companies you have to step out of your comfort zone to an extent that you have to uh, understand the other pain points to get on to a level where in you giving solutions absolutely i think uh, the even even uh, if you you know when we watch the video interviews of many of the leaders including indra noi uh, one of the things she says is um, don't be afraid to fail um and i think uh, sheryl sandberg's quote comes to mind where he says uh, let me fall if i must but the one who i will become will catch me so i think the 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 key there to growth is to step out of the comfort zones and try something new uh, because that's where growth is so go for it and finally what i would say and i'll, I'll wrap with three um sugan the final thing that i would say is um uh, the authenticity you bring to the table right uh, there there could always be a lot of uh, great orators there could always be people who can present the um, uh, rosy pictures of great stories but you know what at the end of the day authenticity shines through so if you're not authentic if you're not someone who is uh, willing to be transparent to your maybe you start at a small level with your managers with your team members with your immediate family friends eventually as you grow up as a leader your own organization if you do not speak with authenticity if you're not willing to um, be open and bear it up and say hey mm-hmm. i messed up this is something we did not do well but listen this is my commitment this is what i do this is what i'm going to do or we are going to do together to fix this and stick to those commitments um uh, you will never be able to assume a leadership role because your 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 true authenticity always shines through regardless of how well you mask it or present it so i think this is something that i would also say is very important for anyone who is aspiring to be a leader to be authentic no no it is very much a trait that people who wish to be not on a leadership level also people who wish to grow should have these traits and you know with this well, i'm going to wrap up this session and it was a pleasure speaking to you listening to your insights the examples you gave and the time you've shared for us as well as for the audience to you know throw light upon this very important and a topical topic so thank you so much for joining us it was a pleasure thank you